Nice. Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. Welcome to, uh, my name is Joe Manning. Welcome to the third year of the Yale Nowell Initiative Lecture Series. It's amazing, it's uh, year three already. Um, it's ex an exciting year um, being launched today by Professor El Fatih El Tahir from MIT. Um, and grateful for his, for his coming down. Uh, he did his uh, bachelor's work at the University of Khartoum, did his PhD uh, at MIT, and never left the joint, as far as I can tell. He, he went, he's went, gone from postdoc through the ranks um, to the Breen M. Heer Professor of Hydrology um, and Climate now. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, um, his CV is uh, incredible, I have to say, having, having read it um, through quite recently. Um, his range of interests is also staggering. Um, I know his work and the project knows his work from work on paleoclimate um, and the Nile um, River. Things like uh, the Siam and El Tahir explaining and forecasting interannual variability in the flow of the Nile River in hydrology and earth system sciences in 2015. Um, and the hugely important role of ENSO, in particular, I think we're gonna hear more about ENSO um, today. ENSO as a main driver of Nile River variability, um, known now mainly through um, his work. Um, <clears throat> climate change enhances interannual variability of the Nile River flow in nature climate change um, from a year or two um, ago. These are seminal articles in our, in our research project. Um, of course, we've talked a lot about them. Um, and joint with Guy Ling Wang, um, Nilometers, El Nino, and Climatic Variability. That's the first article, that way back from 1999, um, where I got to know um, your work in the geophysical research um, letters. Now working on, of course, the Nile River, um, but also on things like uh, malaria and climate change um, worldwide, which is really um, rather, uh, rather important work, um, of course. Um, so climate change, unlikely to increase malaria burden in West Africa, for example, also nature, um, climate change, a, a recent work which sort of showcases, among other things, um, the, the work um, on that front. Today, uh, really thrilled, I can't wait, um, to hear you on hydrology and climate of the Nile Basin, past, present, and future. We could not have a better way to launch um, this year's lecture series. Um, thank you so much for coming, Professor Tahir. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me here and for coming at 4 o'clock on Friday to listen to me. I appreciate that. And I, I, I hope that um, you, will, you will enjoy this, uh, this talk. Um, the picture I show here is the picture for the northeastern corner of Africa. And you see here, even from space, you see the Nile River flowing until it's discharging into the Mediterranean Ocean. You see here, this is the Red Sea. This is the Ethiopian highlands where most of the water comes. I, my connection to the Nile comes not only from my interest and in research and publications. I was born like a kilometer away from the river and I live most of my life like 100 meters away from it. And so by now I lived half of my life back in Sudan and half of my life in the US. And I have been looking at this system through research. And so I have a somewhat uh, unique perspective that I would like to share with you today. Um, the, um, the Nile, um, you know, let, let me start by, and, and so what I would like to talk about today is to give you like snapshots on work that we did looking at the past, the history of the, um, of the Nile, uh, um, um, hydrology, but also things that are happening now and some projections into the future. Um, my uh, background and expertise is in really in hydrology and climate. Um, Joe mentioned that I did my undergraduate work in Sudan as a civil engineer, and then I came and did my PhD at MIT. But there is an intermediate step where I went through. I actually did a master in hydrology in Ireland, in Galway. And so I tell people I moved from a corner of the world where the function of rivers is you take water and you irrigate the land to a place where rivers drain the soil so that you could grow crops. So uh, that was my background in hydrology. And then when I came to MIT, I was fascinated by what's going on in the atmosphere. I wasn't 
um, uh, content on the focus that I had in Galway, where we only looked at rivers and soil moisture and groundwater, I wanted to have a fuller picture of the hydrologic cycle. And so I spent a lot of time at EPS, which is the Earth's Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences Department at MIT, understanding climate processes um, and, and, and taking classes there. So that's, that the topic is going to be the hydrology and climate of the Nile. So um, I would like to start looking at the past by these pictures taken from caves around the Sahara Desert. And the fascinating thing about these pictures, which are dated for thousands of years back, they show pictures of large animals like elephants, cows, giraffe, in areas that now you don't have that kind of um, animals uh, existing there. The climate has changed. And so those were taken as signs of the paleoclimate of that area. And there is many other records that have been summarized in this paper things from like uh, samples from soil, uh, charcoal, human bones, um, large animals, fish, plant remains scattered around the, the, the uh, desert, pointing to the history of the climate of that area being different than the existing climate now. And that has been summarized further in this, organized and summarized in this paper in science, where you have in this dimension, you have basically um, the south to north here in latitude, 16.5 to 29.5 degrees north. This is basically from the area north of current Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, to the area just south of Cairo. So it's extending through um, northern Sudan and southern Egypt. And you have time before present in this dimension and what's shown here is really the evidence that I showed earlier being sorted out and organized, pointing to a green, more humid period that existed about maybe you know, 5,000 to 9,000 years ago. It's pointing to the fact that the Sahara Desert was much more humid during the, during, um, the uh, Holocene and mid-Holocene period. And that's shown mere further here in this series of maps from the same paper, where 8500 BCE, you see evidence that uh, settlements were mostly along, along the river. And then in um, uh, following that, 8500 to 7000 and 7000 to 5300, there is a scattered settlements around. And then again, after the drying came about, people basically moved to live along the Nile Basin. So there is a lot of paleoclimatic evidence suggesting how the dynamics of the Sahara Desert and how, how that changed through times in time scales of thousands of years. Of course, this drying trend, which is similar to what the climate now, you know, result was coincident or coincided with the emergence of the pharaonic civilization. And that's you know, I show you here a picture. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture of Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti, Aten, the uh, uh, god of sun. And this is like maybe Tutankhamun, if, if I don't know if we know that, but that's possibly uh, one of his sons. I'm going to come back to that picture. I'm showing this here not because I'm an Egyptologist or an expert on archaeology of Egypt, but but this is my favorite, I call this my favorite pharaoh. This is Akhenaten. He was quite a revolutionary guy, part of the 18th dynasty. Um, you know, monotheism is like, he's, he's maybe um, the first guy who introduced to that part of the world, it, the monotheism, um, uh, bringing this god Aten. Akhenaten is effective to Aten. Everything, the names, Am Amenhotep, his name before he made the change, was related to uh, Amun, the, 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 the god then, uh, and then, and then Akhenaten, Aten is part of, of his name. He, he was quite revolutionary. He moved the capital to a place called Tel al-Amarna in Egypt now, and, and some of you know about Akhenaten more than me. For me, I'm showing it that it's just like um, an example for, for, a, for, for a significant pharaoh. His mother, however, Tai, um, who was quite a significant lady, 
Uh, she, there are theories that she's of Nubian origin, although some Egyptian, um, you know, um, they may question some of that, but uh, she was quite an influential woman, and, and she lived only like for three years or so during uh, the period in which Akhenaten was, was, was basically the pharaoh of Egypt. So, so there is this shift in the climate of the Sahara. So one of the inter issues that I'm interested in, the intellectual questions I ask, is what caused this shift in the desert border? What processes triggered that shift in the desert border and the expansion of the Sahara? And we would like to understand that for fundamental reasons, but also we would like to test our current group of models, the state-of-the-art models that describe the climate system. One of the test um, uh, examples that we use for is trying to understand how this desert border uh, happened. It's, it's quite um, uh, accepted that changes in the orbital parameters of how the Earth basically rotates around the Sun played a significant role. Changes in the eccentricity cycle, which has, you know, 100,000 years. The obliquity cycle, you know, the eccentricity is how eccentric is this, um, you know, um, um, uh, geometrical object. And how the obliquity, which is the tilt of the axis of the Earth, uh, and how that changes in time scales of 41,000 years. The precision, which is the time in which the the Earth is closest to the Sun, and what time of the year that happens. All these parameters do change, and through what's called the Milankovitch theory, it had been calculated what the periods and what the variations on all these parameters. And so the hypothesis that's quite well accepted is that changes in the orbital parameters of the Earth's uh, Sun system are responsible for that, for that shift in the, in the, in the border of the desert, uh, the Sahara Desert. This is a picture that here shows the distribution of vegetation in Africa, and on top of that you have, these are the um, lines of constant precipitation, these are the uh, precipitation distribution uh, defining the desert border somewhere here. And so with one of the models that was developed in my group, a model that has representation of atmospheric processes, but also of vegetation dynamics, we were able to reproduce the decline of precipitation from the south to the north, which also corresponds to a decline in net primary productivity. So we think of precipitation as a measure of the climate, so it declines from the, this border to north towards the desert, and a decline in net primary productivity that goes with that. So we run the model, we simulate this equilibrium, and then in a series of experiments, we modify the grass conditions at the desert border. So here imagine we have a model of the climate system. It has representation for the atmosphere. It has representation for the biosphere, for the vegetation. It's coupled through land um, uh, surface fluxes of water and, and heat. And that model, when you run it, it reproduces the equilibrium. And so one of my PhD students, Guilin Wang, did experiments in which she perturbed the border of the, um, at the border of the desert, the density of vegetation. You see here, the model has an equilibrium of precipitation of about 250 millimeters. When you perturb the grass, the precipitation increases, but it goes back to an equilibrium. If you perturb it, reducing the density, it recovers again. But if you perturb it large enough, it moves to a different equilibrium. And that's from the theoretical point of view, that was a very significant discovery because it showed for the first time that you have multiple climate equilibria in the coupled land atmosphere system. So people have shown that you have this kind of behavior, multiple equilibria in coupled ocean atmosphere systems. This is the only physically based system model that reproduced this kind of, um, of multiple equilibria, meaning that the climate as it exists has more than one equilibrium under the same forcing, depending on initial conditions. The idea that weather systems are sensitive to initial condition is well established, that's the chaos theory, discovered by Lorenz at MIT in the 1960s. The idea that climate could have multiple equilibria is a new concept that has been shown only in coupled ocean atmosphere systems, However, this is the first time we showed that for land atmosphere system, specifically for the region that's basically uh, close to the Sahara Desert. So another student in my group 
then try to use the same model, which had representation of the climate and the vegetation, to try and simulate what happens to this distribution of precipitation under different conditions of the orbital parameters. So we have 0k, that means the orbital parameters corresponding to today's climate, 6k, basically the orbital parameters corresponding to the climate 6,000 years ago. And you see here, we did experiments assuming that vegetation is static, meaning that when the climate changes, the vegetation does not change and feed back into the system. And we did a set of experiments where we assume that the climate is dynamic. And you see here, you know, the desert border is defined by the 200 millimeter rainfall. And when we um, do all these experiments, assuming initial conditions as current vegetation, we do not re reproduce significant expansion of the desert. It's only about 200 kilometers. What has been observed in paleoclimatic records is expansion of the desert by about 500 kilometers, five degrees or 500 kilometers. And that's, you don't get that when you initialize the model to the current vegetation. The only time in which we were able to do that is when we initialize the model with vegetation that looked like the vegetation that existed 6,000 years ago. Which is again bringing back the idea that in order to be able to simulate the climate of this region, you have to recognize the important role of vegetation dynamics and their role in defining more than one equilibrium for the climate system in that area. And so this is a paper that was able here in this case, you could see here the border of the, of the, um, of the um, Sahara retreated from about 21 degrees north to about 15 degrees north, which is about six degrees north, which is about 600 kilometers. Okay, so this is, in, in addition to the theoretical value of this result, it provides a case for us on how, what kind of processes do you need to include in simulating the climate of that region, not only for now, but also looking at future climates. So the southward shift of the desert margin helped in triggering the emergence of the pharaonic civilization along the Nile. Migration was a dominant mode of adaptation to climate change. And this is something I, I, I didn't mention, I didn't emphasize enough. But here, you know, in this picture, you see how when the climate changed, people basically migrated to the Nile, to the Nile uh, Valley, you know? Hmm? Not, not sh yeah. Sh so that's actually exactly what you would expect. And that's when people look at climate change now, you know, there is the potential and the projection that there are going to be significant migrations associated with with, with climate change in the future. Actually, we just finished um, submitting a proposal to the MacArthur, um, the MacArthur Foundation, um, uh, the group from MIT, um, suggesting that we would develop models to project the climate of Bangladesh in the future. And we would, we would actually, our aim is to be able to um, project conditions under which they will have significant migration as a result of climate change and we are working with an NGO in Bangladesh who would like to be able to proactively plan for migration. So that if you could project like in 15 years or 20 years, the conditions in, in, in a region of Bangladesh would be so severe that people have to migrate, then if you have that projection, you could plan it and it can be an orderly migration. So the issue of migration and how it relates to climate change is an issue that's not only like we see it in the past, but, but it could also be a future issue. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a, a drawing by David Roberts in 1850, traveling in Egypt, and this is the road on Nilometer. You know, the Nilometer, I don't know if everyone here is familiar with what a Nilometer is. You know, it's like thermometer, you measure temperature, and voltmeter, you measure volt, and Nilometer, you measure the Nile. And so, <laughs> And so the Nilometer is basically, this is the river here, and they have this structure next to the river, and you have this graded bar. So people come down these stairs, and they basically make these measurements. And that had been going on in the Nile for, for quite some time. And so based on that record, we have what I believe to be the longest um, human record of geophysical phenomena. And I think some of um, Joe here and, and others have maybe looked at this record and analyzed it. I used it in the paper in 1999 that, that he mentioned. 
a lot of the interest on the on the Nile level has to do with like you know I guess tax collection is that is that some of uh, because the amount of taxation that gets applied had to do with how much water is available and how much agricultural productivity is there. So, so that's in the, in the intermediate period between the thousand of years, hundred of years time scale, we have the longest record for the Nile flow and I use this record in, in some of my research. Now, getting closer, let me give you like a, a very introductory um, note about, about the hydrology of the Nile. So basically, the annual flow of the Nile is about 84 cubic kilometers. And for many people, if you say that, it doesn't mean anything. Because if it, for it to mean anything, you need to get calibrated, right? With some, with some system that you are familiar with. So at MIT, I tell people the uh, Charles River flow is about a cubic kilometer per year. You know, the Charles, especially if you look at the Charles River, you know, it's a small river in front of Harvard, you see it flowing. Here, coming to give this lecture, I figured out the Connecticut River flowing from Massachusetts to Connecticut is about 15 cubic kilometer. Uh, I think a place called Thompsonville, that's where it crosses from Massachusetts to Connecticut, is about 15 cubic kilometer. The Mississippi is about 500. Um, the Yellow River is about 80, 80 cubic kilometer. So the Nile is 84 cubic kilometer. And usually I think about it in terms of units of 12 cubic kilometers. Okay? So Two of those units come from Uganda into South Sudan. One of the units basically get lost through evaporation. And another unit comes from Ethiopia here, one cubic kilometer. So that adds to the one that's remaining from Uganda to give the White Nile two cubic kilometers. So White Nile gets two cubic kilometers flowing and, and meeting the Blue Nile in Khartoum in Sudan. The Blue Nile brings four cubic kilometers Actually, I'm sorry, four units. So this is all in terms of a unit is 12 cubic kilometers. So two units, one unit, then you have two units. You have four units coming from the Blue Nile. That makes it six coming in the Nile. Adbara River brings in one, so that's seven. So the Nile in Egypt brings seven of these units. But if you want to see where the water is coming from, you see here, one, four, and one. These are six units out of the seven are coming from Ethiopia. Okay, that's important because it has a lot of implications. Like, you know, for example, there is a whole effort now, something called the Nile Basin Initiative, where they bring all these 12 countries, Rwanda and Uganda and Kenya and like so, everyone that has anything to do with the Nile, and they sit in the same table trying to figure out how to share the water. And I tell them you can't do that because not all these players have the same weight. You know, some of them like, for example, Tanzania and Ethiopia, there is nothing between the two. And there is nothing. The climate of Tanzania is different than Ethiopia. The rainfall system that brings the rain to Tanzania and Ethiopia is different. Um, there is no water flowing from Tanzania to Ethiopia. There is no connection. But they sit down on the Nile Basin Initiative and they argue and argue and argue as if they really have something that they share. So understanding the hydrology of the Nile is very important. And so you get from this picture that the rainfall over Ethiopia is very important. It's actually six out of seven units that come, that's come from there. And that's, and that's important in determining the hydrology. So this flux, the, the, the fluctuations in the Nile River have been of interest to people living in the Nile for like long time. This is a story in the Bible and the Quran, the, you know, Prophet Joseph and his you know, dream of seven years of plenty followed by seven years of droughts followed by seven years of plenty followed by seven years of droughts and shortages. And, and you know, people recite that in the Quran and I think it's stories in the Bible and, 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 other, and other books. There is speculation, and I don't know, I, I don't think we know, but there is speculation that the pharaoh at the time of, of, of Joseph was Amenhotep III. And Amenhotep III is the father of Akhenaten. But there are people who dispute that, and so it's not, there may not be any factual basis behind that. But this guy had unprecedented prosperity and cultural and international power. So that time has been a time of really uh, significant um, uh, status for, for that part of the world. So what caused the year-to-year -year fluctuations of the Nile? We see it here in this figure, like, you know, there is a lot of fluctuations. And here we see it in the story of Joseph. It's really, even if you don't believe in any religion, 
the fact that these stories come in the Bible and the Quran, they point to the fact that these fluctuations are important for society, are, are, are pretty important for, for people there. And so one of the things that we looked at recently with the records, and the Nile had very good records. For example, measured flow at Aswan, we have 150 years of data. That's a significant amount of data, 150 years. And the features of the, of the, of the variation in the river, you have a very strong you know, seasonality, basically. You have very strong seasonality peaking around September or so. And then you have very high level of fluctuations from year to year. This is 100 years of data and you see how, how rich is that signal. So you see it here, you know, more uh, zooming in, you see very significant fluctuation. These are the kind of fluctuation that Joseph and, and the story of Joseph really um, is, is concerned about. We have done a paper in 1996 in which we've shown that there is a significant correlation between the El Nino phenomenon, which is something I'm going to talk about, and the annual flood of the Nile, such that warming, which, con which, which coincides with El Nino, results in droughts. So when you have El Nino, you get droughts. When you have La Nina, you get, you get floods. And the correlation explains the, the sea surface temperature in the Pacific Ocean explains about 25 to 30 percent of the interannual variability in the, in the flow of the Nile. So let me give you, for those of you who are not familiar with El Nino, let me give a little bit of video that shows, give background. Every few years, the El Nino phenomenon kicks into life in the Pacific Ocean around the equator. It can affect weather around the world, changing the odds of floods, drought, heat waves and cold seasons for different regions, even raising global temperatures. But what is El Nino and how does it happen? Firstly, we need to know what's normally happening in the tropical Pacific. This vast stretch of ocean sees consistent winds called trade winds that blow from east to west. These winds push warm water near the surface in their direction of travel, so the warm water piles up on the western side of the ocean around Asia and Australasia. On the other side of the ocean, around South and Central America, as the warmer water gets pushed away from the coast, it's replaced by cold water which is pulled up from deeper down in the ocean, a process called upwelling. This creates a temperature difference across the tropical Pacific, with warmer water piled up in the west and cooler water in the east. Warmer water adds extra heat to the air, which causes the air to rise with more vigor, and it's this rising air that creates an area of more unsettled weather, with more cloud and rainfall. That rising air in the west sets up atmospheric circulation across this part of the world, with warm, moist air rising on one side of the ocean and cooler, drier air descending on the other. This circulation reinforces the easterly winds, so this part of the world sits in a self-perpetuating state until El Nino begins. If conditions are right, tropical Pacific weather systems, or slow changes in the ocean around the equator, can set off a chain of events which weaken or even reverse the usual trade winds. With weakened trade winds, there's less push of warm surface water to the western side of the ocean and less upwelling of cold water on the eastern side. This allows the usually colder parts of the ocean to warm, cancelling out the normal temperature difference. Because the area of warmest water moves, so does the associated wet and unsettled weather. This changes rainfall patterns over the equatorial Pacific as well as the large-scale wind patterns. It's this change in winds which has a knock-on effect, changing temperature and rainfall in locations around the world. The main impacts are around the tropics, where you see an increase in the risk of floods in Peru and droughts in Indonesia, India and parts of Brazil. But virtually wherever you are in the world, El Nino has the potential to affect you directly via the weather or indirectly via socio-economic impacts. There's another impact from El Nino which happens because of all the extra heat at the surface of the tropical Pacific. This releases vast amounts of energy into the atmosphere which can temporarily push up global temperatures. 
This is why El Nino years often feature among the warmest on record. Each El Nino event is different, so the global impacts can change. You can find out more about the differing impacts of El Nino on our website. So you see, he didn't mention the Nile. Actually, the Nile is one of the most impacted regions by El Nino. If you look at correlations, as I said earlier, the sea surface temperature in the Pacific explains 25 to 30 percent of the interannual variability in the Nile. So El Nino is a major factor in shaping climate variability and climate change over the Nile Basin in the past and in the future. And actually, another uh, application of El Nino comes from the fact that it's quite predictable. So this is actually predictions made, you know, um, by the ECMWF system. They are made in April, and you could see that uh, the ensemble of, of predictions, the observations, very much followed the mean of the ensemble. So the phenomenon is pretty predictable. And so if you could predict El Nino, and if you know that El Nino occurrence is results in droughts, then you could predict conditions of droughts or floods on the Nile. And you could do that with significant lead time. And that's what methodology we have, we have done. It's a very simple methodology. So we basically say, based on the ENSO index, ENSO is a linear southern oscillation. It's, it's an index of this phenomenon. When it's warm, then you have basically a linear condition. When it's cold, you have the reverse, which is La Nina. And you could have normal conditions. And then you could compute the probability that the flood of the Nile would fall in any of these categories based on the past record. So we did that. And we have this table that could be used and actually is being used operationally to make seasonal forecasts of conditions of uh, flooding and droughts in the Nile. So basically, if in one year you know that the likelihood is that you are going to have warm SST El Nino, you could almost rule out the possibility of having a high flood. So it's most likely low or average flow. Vice versa, if you have La Nino condition, you could almost rule out having low flow and you could predict average to high conditions. In more recent history, um, if you look at this is the, the record, and the years here with full circle are years in which you have an Nino. I would like to bring your attention to these four years. These are four years towards the end of the 19th century, on early 20th century, and you see every time we had a very low flow year, we had an Nino condition. It's actually, this is very, I think, find this very remarkable, Especially, I would like to bring to your attention this 1888 event. And 1888 is significant because in Sudan, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's related to what's called the famine of the uh, 1306 Hijri year. In Sudan, the, the, the uh, calendar is actually according to the Hijri. Hijri is like the year in which the Prophet Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina. So that's the Islamic calendar is based on that. And so when I grew up in Sudan, I used to hear from like my relatives and you know, grandmother and so on, it's like the famine of, of six, of the year six, which is the famine of like 1306. When I started looking at the records of the Nile the first time, you know, the year six doesn't have, a, doesn't have any Nino in it. But when you do the translation, the year six in Hijri is corresponds to 1888. And that's, that was an Nino year, you see it here. It's, it's well featured, and that's the year in which Sudan had a major famine. And so, so this year had, this famine had a large impact with many stories reflected in the, in the oral history. However, if you look at this same record, as I was discussing earlier with, with Joe, the 1914 year is actually the lowest flow year in the Nile that had been recorded. The flow was only about 40 cubic kilometers. It didn't receive really enough attention in terms of studies. This is the year in which the Nile brought the least water. And that year, although the Nile brought the least water, there is no record of any problem. No famine, no nothing. I haven't heard about that year in the oral history. Okay? So the question is why? And so in the 1880s, it wasn't only that you had a natural hazard from a drought, but also the socioeconomic situation was quite poor and unstable. That's the year in which Sudan was ruled by, um, by um, uh, a guy called the Khalifa Abdullah, who was actually busy at that time trying to you know, conquer Ethiopia. And he took all people from their work. And so the socioeconomic and political situation was quite unstable. So the lesson you learn from there is that the risk from climate variability or climate change 
is not really just the national hazard, but also the level of vulnerability in society. And so that's why adaptation and being ready for, for climate change is an, important, is an important concept. So looking at the current state in the Nile Basin, this is a table that I generated based on the CIA World Factbook. And you see here the population of Egypt is about 100 million, Ethiopia 105, Sudan about 35, and the population is growing across the board. You know, you see the, the economic situation. Ethi Egypt is in much better shape than Sudan and Ethiopia, you know, $13,000 um, uh, per capita. Um, economies are growing, but you see quite significant disparity in the production of electricity per capita, which is a very good measure of how people like standard of living. You know, Egypt has like maybe four or five times what, what the average Ethiopian gets. Um, you know, the average Sudanese and even the average Ethiopian is like 18 times. And so the, in general, and, and you see the level of electrification in Egypt compared to, to Ethiopia and Sudan is also there is significant disparity. And that what points, that's just one element that points to urgent needs for sustainable development in Africa. You know, there is, you know, when you look at Africa, it's not the issues are not only climate change, the environment, there is the poverty and the needs for development. This is what I call the equation of Africa's future. This is a, an equation that I invented a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm actually I'm very proud of. It's a very simple equation that tells you a lot about what's going on in Africa, I think. And, and, and I think everyone here could understand what's there. This is, you know, C is for crops. So this is crops production, which means in agricultural country, this is really the economy. You know, the economy, Africa, mostly agriculture. So the more crops you produce, the better in agriculture um, terms. W is the amount of water that's available. So that's basically water availability, which is mainly linked to climate. T is how you transform that water into crops, which is technology. What kind of technology you do. So uh, that's why I'm using the word T. And then I do that per person, which is P, you know, population size. So how much water, how do you use the water, and how many people do you have? And that gives you some idea about, about your, you know, economic status. So if you do like 1801 at MIT, I think math, here I don't know, you have numbers for the subjects. Over there, every subject has a number. The basic, the basic calculus, you do the, um, um, you know, manipulate this equation and you end up in this, in this equation here. And what it is, is actually economic growth. That's the relative change in the productivity here. Uh, the change in water availability, that's climate change. Technology adoption is an important factor. And population growth is another important factor. And the interesting thing here is that population growth is the only thing that shows up with negative sign. I like that fact very much. Everything is positive, except when it comes to population, it's a negative contribution. So what, what, I, what I tell people, this is my in like list of topics. When I talk about things in Africa, I think these are the issues to be th we think about. It's climate change, technology adoption, and population growth. And so let's look at them one by one. Technology adoption. In this context, was context was technology adoption is really agricultural technology. And so here is the agricultural efficiency defined as the mass of crop produced per unit volume of water. Okay? And that's function of how you use water. So how much volume of water transpired by plants per unit volume of water used. And crop productivity is how much crop you produce per unit volume of water. Those are two different things. This is hydrology, and this is agricultural productivity. Okay? And so when you look at that, we, there is a need to be efficient in terms of water use efficiency. There is a need to basically line canals, use water more wisely, line canals. You need to application losses reduce them. That means flood irrigation versus drip irrigation. So that will all increase the water use efficiency. And you need to use irrigation. And irrigation is something that has expanded during the 20th century dramatically around the world. The, the area equipped for, for irrigation increased by a factor of five during the 20th century. While in Africa, it's only 6% of the cultivated land now is, is really irrigated. So Africa lags the world in, in terms of, of irrigation. 
and you know, compared to 37% in Asia and 14% in Latin America. You, look, you zoom and you look at Africa, aside from the Egyptian Delta and Jazeera in Sudan, there is no significant irrigation done in Africa. Actually, it's very striking in explaining what's happening in agriculture in Africa is that you know, there is very little irrigation being done. So uh, there is strong needs for more efficient irrigation in the Nile. So going back to this equation now, we have water use efficiency, we also have crop productivity. And this is one of the most striking figures that I, I really think is important to show what's going on in the Nile and in Africa. This is how much productivity of agriculture as a function of application of fertilizers. And with application of fertilizers, it goes also irrigation and other technological advances. These least developed countries, Tillman, the person who produced this figure, tells me these are basically African countries. African countries use very little fertilizers and produce very little in terms of agriculture. And so developed countries of the world in Europe and North America, they are in red here. Asian countries have really went up the stairs here and they are producing more. So the issue of low productivity of agriculture in Africa is a very important issue that needs to be addressed. You see that here in the distribution of nitrogen fertilizers around the world, Africa, very little application compared to South America, North America, Europe, and Asia. Here you see Africa is all in purple. There is very little in, in Egypt, nothing else, including in the Nile Basin. But you look at Europe, is being fertilized like, you know, very significantly. You know, Asia, India had had its green revolution. China had its green revolution. You know, North America is large areas, receive a lot of nutrients. However, Africa is still down there. So I think in terms of adoption of technology, agriculture technology, Africa has a long way to go. And that's any investments in really in the Nile Basin or in Africa, that has to be a priority. So technology adoption is, is, is an area that needs a lot of attention. Population growth is another big problem in Africa. I actually believe that without addressing the population growth in the Nile Basin and in Africa, there is no future for that continent. It's, it's a very, you know, very maybe broad statement, but I really believe it. It's, it's, it and, and the reason is, is what I'm going to show in a minute. This is here the population of Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan, you know, and it's, it's being increasing very rapidly. I came, to, you know, to MIT, as Joe said, in 1988. Uh, now, in 30 years, the population doubled. When I, you know, when I was at school, we were told the population of Egypt is 40 million. Now it's 105 million. Um, Ethiopia is similarly. And you see it here. Even with just what the population momentum, some of you are familiar with that concept, the population momentum is huge and the population is going to double in the next 30 years again. Okay? And that's, that's a problem, you know? Um, uh, what these numbers mean for water per capita, it brings these countries from water is scarce to absolutely water is scarce, less than 500 cubic meters per, per person. So the issue of population is a very significant issue in the Nile Basin. Look at, look at here, you know, this is the projections of how the most populous 10 countries in, in, in the world. In 1950, there was no country from Africa. 1950, none of the African countries made it. 2015, Nigeria joined the list. And the projection by 2050, you will have five countries from Africa. I think, yeah, five countries from Africa or, or four maybe, Nigeria, um, Nigeria, Congo, Ethiopia, and Egypt, four countries from Africa, two of them from the Nile Basin. So two countries from the Nile Basin are going to join the most populous countries in the world, okay? And the river flow is still the 84 cubic kilometer. You know, it didn't change. So except for climate change is going to add a little bit, but not much. So that's, that's a problem, I think, and, and, and as I showed earlier here, you know, the different projections, they, they make very little difference on how much increase. So the story is the following. The world now has seven billions. Africa has one of the seven. The projection by 2050, the world is going to add two billions. One of those two is going to be in Africa. So the continent that has the least capacity to absorb any population 
is going to be, and ha now has 15% of the population, is going to be responsible for 50% of the increase. Okay? So that's, that's a very grim picture for Africa, and I think it needs, it needs to, be, to be addressed. I go back to Akhenaten in this picture, and actually you could see one dominant thing I noticed. This picture had a lot of things I could tell you about. For example, Akhenaten, you know, seems to be very, very nice to his child. African, African um, men are not supposed to be very, like, emotional to their children. That's not, that's not sort of as very positive in the African culture in general. Akhenaten here, you know, he's kissing his child. But one other thing you see here is that there are three children here in this picture, you know? And when I did a search about Nefertiti, she had six children, okay? So by that time, you know, like thousands of years ago, you know, a woman on average will have that kind of, of number of people. The, the best way to address the issue of population is to increase the enrollment of girls in secondary schools. Okay, that seems to be the most effective way. It's really a matter of conservation of time. Nowadays, in many parts of Africa, girls do not really go into secondary school. They stay at home, get married, and have children. The more you have them spend time at schools, they will have the less time to have, to have more children. So that's, that works. This is the correlation that you would expect. You know, African countries are in green here. And look at the total fertility rate. It's about five or six. So we didn't move from the time of Akhenaten to now, okay? It is still, it's still the same rate of, 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 uh, of, of births, uh, and that's something that I think has to, has to change. And you see the rest of the world, it, you know, uh, basically moved down here uh, to two or so, and that's, that's, that's what Africa needs to go. So these are the second issue, which is, you know, technology adoption, population growth. Let's look at climate change, and very quickly, until recently, the answer to climate change, especially on the Nile, we say that we don't really know. Half of the models are saying you're going to have more water. Half of the models say that you're going to have less water. And this is detailed in this figure. Recently, I had a PhD student of mine who made a little bit of progress in this paper that, that uh, Joe mentioned earlier. So this is records of flow here in the Upper River and also in the Upper Blue Nile. When these rivers are analyzed, you know, this is the moving average, you find that there is, on average, in, in, in the Adbara and in the Blue Nile, there have been an increase in the mean flow. The mean increase by about 10% in the Blue Nile and 17% in the Adbara River. Also, the standard deviation seems to be increasing similarly. And that, that variability, you know, in the past, has been associated, the coefficient of variation in the Nile flow, this is, this is a very interesting figure. This is the number of El Nino and La Nina events, number of El Nino and La Nina events in the past record, and in blue, you have the coefficient of variation in the Nile, and you see they, they basically match each other. So, increased occurrence of El Nino and La Nina leads to having more variability on the Nile, meaning more floods and droughts. And so, there have been a couple of papers in Nature Climate Change by a group of oceanographers, long group of oceanographers, that basically suggested that there would be increasing frequency of extreme El Nino events due to greenhouse warming and increased frequency of extreme La Nina events under global warming. So basically they are telling us, these oceanographers, based on all set of models that they run, that they are going to have more of these El Nino and La Nina events. So what that would tell you, would tell you that the Nile is likely to have more variability, okay? And so, when this student of mine analyzed the records of all the GCMs, he showed that, you know, there were going to be a small increase in the mean by about 15%. However, that will come up with an increase in the standard deviation by 50%. So think about it. So what this is saying is that the future of the Nile is going to be, on average, more water, but that water is going to come with a lot of variability. Meaning, one year you have a lot of flow, and some year, next year you have very low flow. So what is the solution of that? We don't have engineers here, do we? Do we have anyone from, you don't have an engineering school at Yale, do you? No, we don't have, we don't have an, there is no engineering school here, right? There is. There, there is, okay. So with, this, with the engineers in the room, if you have a river that has, you know, one year you have a lot of flow, the other year you have a small flow, what do you do? Capture, hmm? Capture the water. Capture the water, store it, build dams. That's, you know, 
And that's the, the fight in denial now is about a dam that actually coming even, it had nothing to do with climate change. That's Ethiopia wants to really just use the, the record of, of that they have. But what this is saying, there is more water, little bit, but if you want to really use it, you have to capture it. And you have to store it means you have to build more dams. Okay? So that's, you know, what's shown here. The number of El Nino and La Nina events is going to increase in the future, consistent with this oceanographer's studies. And, and so the coefficient of variation of denial is going to increase, which means we are going to uh, need to build more dams. We made the estimates here in this figure about, you know, this is the time and how the storage in denial increased. The highest one dam was introduced in 1970. It increased the storage by about 130 cubic kilometers. And now the GERD, which is being planned, is, is basically going to increase the, the storage. However, what we are showing from this is that in the future, because of the increased variability, there has to be an increase in the amount of storage that you are going to need to have. And so that's, that's what, what this uh, study basically, basically concluded. And so I would like to show this, uh, maybe it's getting a little bit um, the time, for the sake of time, maybe I will not show this video. This is a video that we have. Uh, so do you have time? Okay, so let's, let's, let's show this video and it will summarize the study.
So, in summarizing, just uh, the future of the Nile Basin, I think control of the rapid rate of population growth is the number one priority, not only for the Nile, for Africa. Really, I, I think it's a very serious problem that does not get enough attention. And I talk about it in most of my presentations like this. I talk about it in Africa. And, and people like, you know, you know it's, not, it's controversial. But I think, I think the evidence is very clear that you cannot go in the current, uh, in the current path. Investments in irrigation and agricultural technology, fertilizers, better seeds, is a close second. It's very important. You know, there are parts of Africa. You know, when I first came to MIT in 1988 in the Parsons lab, fertilizer was a bad word. Because, you know, uh, the, atmosphere, the environmental chemists in the lab, they basically think of it as a source of pollution. Because there is so much pollution, uh, fertilizer is applied in the Midwest and elsewhere, that it, it comes in the drains and becomes a problem. You know, in, the, in Africa, in many parts of Africa, actually the nutrients in the soil are being depleted by not adding fertilizer, growing crops, and then taking the crops and exporting them. You are taking nutrients out of the soil. It's a very different world. And so investments in like um, fertilizer um, factories, for example, I recently proposed that Sudan with this change that's happening, uh, political change, one of the things that they should invest in is they should build a big fertilizer factory in the heart of the agricultural region and, and, and produce a lot of nutrients that could really go around and, and, and supply the soils. So that's a very important factor. Challenges of population growth, adoption of agricultural technology, and climate change are much more significant than those associated with any dam. You, you notice that I, I hardly mention the Gerd Dam, right? I think it, the Gerd is, is a manufactured, manufactured problem for political reasons. It's not really, it's not, it's not even close to being the heart of what the problem in the Nile Basin is. It's a symptom of the conflict, and it's not the root cause of it. Even if tomorrow, I was telling Joe earlier, if tomorrow Egypt and Ethiopia are happy friends and they solve the problem of the, of the GERD, we still have the population growth, right? And we don't have enough water. We still have climate change. And we still have agricultural productivity that's very low. Those are the issues. And if you think about it, if you increase agricultural productivity and if you use water more efficiently, you could do more with the existing water. And, and then you could be, have less, less conflict. Ad adaptation to climate change will be needed in the future, so better plan for it now. And it's absolutely the time to ignite the Africa's green revolution, you know? And if someone is wondering where would I get the money to ignite that revolution, I have a slide on that that I don't have the time to talk about. But that's, that's it. Thank you very much, and sorry for going slightly above. Wonderful, thank you very much. There's time for some comments, questions. I'm gonna ask you to use this very old fashioned looking microphone just so we record comments and questions. Yeah, please. Uh, microphone. Okay. Thank you. Are there political aspects to the water distribution in the Nile uh, Basin? between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. Um, are they in agreement or are they competing? And especially given that Egypt is the more advanced, more powerful, and one of the two most populated countries, um, what is its um, relationship to the other two countries regarding the distribution of water? Okay. So that's, that's an important question. You know, as I showed earlier, the Nile brings 84 cubic kilometers per year. That's measured at S1. You have to first recognize that there is a difference between Ethiopia and Egypt. Ethiopia is closer to the example of Ireland I talked about when I first talked. You know, you need to drain Ethiopia. The Nile drains water out of Ethiopia. So it's, it has plenty of rainfall. Egypt has no rainfall. It's all the water of the Nile. So that, that's a significant natural difference. The 84 cubic kilometer that I talked about is measured at Aswan. In 1959, Sudan and Egypt signed an agreement on sharing of that 84 cubic kilometer that's measured at Aswan. They built the highest one dam so that after they built the highest one dam, no water goes to the Mediterranean. So they could use all the water. 
and they agreed that the 84, they estimated 10 cubic kilometer would be lost through evaporation. That's comparable to the flow of the Connecticut River. A lot of water goes through evaporation, so they took that out. They didn't count against Egypt or Sudan, they put it aside. The 74, they divided it, 55.5 for Egypt and 18.5 for Sudan. Okay, so that's an agreement that's binding between Sudan and all Sudan, because Sudan had split into two countries, all Sudan and Egypt, 55.5, 18.5. A lot of my friends in Sudan, you know, like to complain about this and this is unfair. How can you give Egypt 55.5 and you give Sudan only 18.5? The truth of the matter is, is that agreement did not get into effect till today. Because when would the agreement come in? The agreement would come in into effect, become binding, if Sudan starts using 20 cubic kilometer. Then Egypt will say, no, 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 you can't do that. You only have 18.5, okay? You have to let the 1.5 flow down the river. Sudan now uses like maybe, it's controversial, but maybe 14, 15, 13. So still there is water that flows from Sudan into Egypt for free. Okay, it just goes there because you know, Sudan is not using it. Ethiopia, however, does not recognize the agreement between Sudan and, and Egypt. They were not part of it, not, not consulted, they are not accepting it. So for them, they don't like even the word 1959. I organized a workshop at MIT, I brought people from Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt, and you know, every time we talk about 1959, you know, the blood pressure from my Ethiopian friends will go up. They don't want, that's not really, they don't like it. They don't want to talk about it. It's not something that they, they accept. So if, that's why, you know, when this dam now Ethiopia wants to build, the Gert Dam, you know, uh, there is no uh, agreement between Ethiopia and Egypt that could really guide what, what to do, how to do that. So we have some ideas. I have actually a, a book coming soon about how to share this water in, in a rational way. So if you're interested in the topic, I could be happy to send you a copy of the book. It's an electronic book that will come very soon. But, but, but when you think here, one good news about climate change is that it's going to bring in a little bit more water. Okay, it's about you know five, six, seven cubic kilometers. That's actually good news because it could have been the other way around. Imagine in this situation where there is already a conflict if climate change is going to bring less water. That's going to be a problem. So population going up and water going down. You know, that's, that becomes, but now I think like many parts of the world, it, climate change in general will bring more water with exceptional regions. Actually, this is something that's not realized. It's not, it's not, um, recognized enough, it's not emphasized enough, maybe more accurate, about climate change. Climate change in general will bring more precipitation around the world, except with exceptions, like the Mediterranean, other regions, they are going to get less water. But the majority of the regions of the world are going to get more water. So the Nile is going to get its share of it, which is going to be about 10, 15%. Okay? It's nice to see um, science in the service of public policy. This is really um, fascinating. And that early 20th century case study is a nice example. I guess that's sort of luck because in the British were there in the early mm -hmm. 20th century, of course, and the, the 1902 dam was in place. So that, uh, in part, uh, mitigated uh, what could have been um, a serious problem in 1913-14. Um, in the current conditions, though, you say we need more storage. That seems pretty clear. Where would you put more storage in the Nile Basin, given that GERD is going to be online in another year or two, presumably? Where else? How? What do you conceive of? That? Maybe that's your paper. But yeah, that's, there are to, there are regions, there are sites in Sudan that had been identified for potential potential dams. Uh -huh. There are places in Ethiopia where you could do the same. So there are sites around, and and it's it's it's, it's wiser and it's smarter to do the damming upstream where evaporation would be significantly less. Um, and so I think for now, you know, this is a new concept. The idea that with climate change, you are going to get, need to have more storage is something yeah. that we just published a couple of years and it did not really penetrate into the system yet. 
but but that's uh, but there are there are enough sites where they could think of of building okay. those dams. But above GERD, yes, so all, all in Ethiopia, yes, which might create some interesting political. Problems yeah, or, yeah. Or I think that I think people have to. I I think people have to resolve this issue of how they cooperate. You know how they like share this water in a rational way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gerd actually has one feature about it that's very interesting. That I have a paper about it that hadn't been published yet. Gerd actually, um, by virtue of its location, is brought in the interest of Ethiopia and Egypt together, because um, um, any use of water, consumptive use of water upstream in Ethiopia meaning irrigation in Ethiopia, which is a consumptive use. Hydropower is not a consumptive use. You just store and release. Irrigation, however, you consume the water. It disappears. So any consumptive use of water in Ethiopia will reduce the water not only for downstream countries, but for generation of hydropower in Ethiopia itself. Think about it. Because GERD is located right at the border between Sudan and Ethiopia. So it's the last point from which you cannot produce hydropower and then consume the water. Yeah. That's actually a very interesting concept. It's, it's not, and, and, it's, and, and it's not by design, it happened by chance. You know, it happened, by, I guess my <laughs> friends in Ethiopia, if they had a way of like, you know, if, if now they have a resort, maybe they would put it upstream, yeah. yeah. okay? <laughs> to, but, 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 but by virtue of where it is, it brings in the interests of Ethiopia and Egypt mm, together. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. So, um, so, but, but I, think, I think that's, um, you know, um, there is going to be locations where they could, where they could um, mm -hmm. store that water. But, but clearly it's going to be, you know, one thing about this paper that we just, um, we refer to here, is that it's not only, I don't know what happened here, but it's, 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 not, um, it's not only, uh, modeling result, but this is observations. You see here in observations, the standard deviation has been going up. The mean increased, and, and uh, yeah, the, the, the standard deviation um, of, of, of the flow has been going up, and this is the observations. So, so, so uh, you know, with increase, and, and also anecdotally, you could see that in, 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 in recent records that, you know, you get one year with a lot of flooding, and another year with, with low flow. So the system is changing. Mm -hmm. Any question? Any from the student side of things? No, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for- uh, No other? Yeah, anyone really? else? Yeah, please. Are they working on like underground cisterns like to capture the rain? You know, not just from the river, but just in the mm. rain to capture? That's a good question, actually. That's what they call rainfall harvesting. Yeah. They are doing a lot of that in Sudan, but not underground. They are doing it, um, um, basically they build dams to capture the rain and then use the water. Um, the problem with that is that a lot of the water evaporates. Yeah. So one of the regions I have been studying, other than the Nile, I have a major project in, in, in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And Morocco is a country that not only it receives little rain now, the projections are that they are going to get significantly less rain, 30%. So you think that, compare that to the Nile case. You know, that's why I'm saying the Nile case of like 10, 15% is good news. Because, because like, you know, um, Morocco is going to get significantly less if, if the trends continue. So one of the proposals, actually I was working on this just yesterday with one of my um, affiliates, uh, the ones working with me from, from Morocco, is we propose a solution where, where you basically dig a storage facility under the ground, and when it rains, you take the water and you store it, and you close, you lit, you close the lid on it. You basically, you don't let it evaporate. Because in Sudan, they are doing a lot of rainfall harvesting, but, but when you build a dam and the water gets collected, and then it evaporates, a lot of it evaporates. And so, and, or, or, or seeps into the soil, so you lose it. And so we need to have more and more of these kind of engineering solutions uh, to be able to uh, provide enough water for people around the world.
Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for.